Welcome to Pitch 360. My name is Edie Lush, and I'm the executive editor of Hub Culture. I'm your host here this afternoon. Really pleased to be with you. Uh, Hub Culture, by the way, is uh, a, a company with a, a virtual state. Or sorry, we're building the tools to go into a virtual state. That includes a virtual currency and a digital identity. I also have a podcast called The Global Goals Cast, which looks at the stories of the champions who are making the world a better place. And that includes those who are making the world a better place through financial inclusion. So I'm very excited about this afternoon. However, when I was preparing what I was going to say uh, to you guys, especially if the technology goes wrong, not that it will, um, I had all my big numbers ready about, fi uh, about FinTech in 2018, 36.6 billion dollars of venture capital invested, over 2,300 deals, two and a half times the amount invested from 2017. And then I saw the FT this morning, where it said venture capital funding into fintech was slumping in the first quarter, with China taking the worst hit. So is it all over? Can we all go home? No, of course not. Uh, we still saw $6.3 billion invested through venture capital in the first quarter of 2019, and that number of global deals rise to 445. And while China's slowing, we're also seeing investment going into Southeast Asia and India, as well as Europe. And we are really in no better place than the United Kingdom to be uh, today, because last year the UK had the second largest number of fintech deals. And according to our hosts at Innovate Finance, the first quarter of 2019 has already seen over a billion dollars of capital invested through angel, VC, and private equity money. So on to today. We are here uh, with eight categories of fintech companies, several companies pitching in each category. I'll tell you how it's going to go. We're going to have um, each finalist will have three minutes to present themselves and their pitch. We'll have three minutes for our judges to ask a couple of questions, and then it is over to you guys in the audience to vote. Um, after all the categories have pitched, we'll have a very quick comfort break, uh, after which we'll announce the result of each winning category. Then the judges are going to quiz the category winners, uh, and while they go off to deliberate, we're going to have a conversation with two amazing people uh, about how female founders can get more investment. Uh, and this session will be a treat. I, I tell you, we've got Priyanka uh, Lila Romani and Susan Sternglass Noble for that. And then we'll announce the overall winner. So we've got 24 innovative startups today. The categories were created by looking at all the companies that entered and then creating them around there. So there is a bit of crossover. But when I was going through them, I was really excited to see the different problems that these guys are coming up with solutions to. Fair ways to issue credit. Ways for more people across the world to access financial products like loans or insurance, safe communications, more targeted search, and better ways to get paid. So I want to introduce our judges here as well today. So I'm just going to ask you to turn around and wave if you can. I don't know if you can twist in your chair if you've done your yoga today. Uh, Doris Honnell from Standard Chartered. Helen Aluni Boteri, Wells Fargo Startup Accelerator. Hank Van Huel, Digital and Innovation at the Post Office, Laura Coffey, on Fido, Michael Smith from Prodigy Finance, and Mike Segal, Upside Partners and 500 Startups. So none of today and this afternoon would be possible without the support of Intel. And I'm delighted now to introduce Dan Kosolovich, the Global Head of FinTech and Partner Enabling. Thank you, Edie. Thank you all. So uh, I'm actually filling in for somebody. I'm a last minute fill in, you know, with this presentation. But this is not my first time here. This is actually the third time that I'm participating at uh, Pitch360. So two years ago, I did the same thing, intro pitch. Last year, I was at the judges' table, enjoyed it immensely. So given the history, this year, I wanted to kind of outdo myself, and Edie know, knows how well it was done two years ago. So I had a plan to do like a really long, elaborate, grandiose speech. So last night, went to my room, all prepared, like really hyped up, had a coffee, everything. And I just like, you know, tried to, uh, to browse, you know, 
the cable just a little bit to relax. And the funniest thing, here in UK, Game of Thrones <laughs> is on Monday. So instead of like a, this really long, grandiose speech, I'm going to do short and sweet pitch for Intel. And uh, hopefully usher you know, in, us into, into this great competition. So uh, why am I excited about this uh, competition? It is very simple. Here we have 24 startups in eight carefully selected relevant fintech categories solving real world problems. That is very important to say. Some are solving consumer problems, some are solving enterprise problems, some are solving both. But that's not the only thing they all have in common. A single most important common denominator in all of these is data. Smart, innovative utilization of diverse and ever-growing data is a key for success of new technologies positioned in financial services. And it is true for most other verticals. Let me illustrate this uh, data explosion with uh, another fresh fact. So 50% of all the data in history has been created in the last two years. The last two years, 50%. And yet we are using only 2% for insights. This is where Intel comes into the picture. Our mission is to help our customers prosper and grow in an increasingly data-centric world. We are working hard to allow our customers to extract more value out of their data. We are delivering the innovation and technology to unleash the power of data. Actually, this month we had the first truly data-centric portfolio launch in our history. It reflects a broader transition inside Intel to drive innovation across CPUs, FPGAs, memory, storage, software, and security. As we heard in many of the sessions in day one and day two, artificial intelligence and its building blocks, machine learning, deep learning, and the cloud in all its variants, public, private, everything in between, are key technologies to enable innovation and solutions in the financial services industry. We are embedding accelerators for both AI and virtualization in our chips. Moreover, we are embedding security features such as SGX, which comes very handy in many, if not all, of the business applications. We're investing to move data faster, to store more data, and to process everything. Our portfolio is broader than at any moment in our history. To move data faster, we have Ethernet solutions, silicon photonics, and Omnipath fabric. To store more data, we have Optane data center persistent memory, Optane SSDs, QLC NAND SSDs. And to process everything, we have innovation in CPUs, including accelerators in FPGAs, and AI ASICs. <clears throat> One part of our portfolio has been especially game-changing in FSI, in financial services industry. It is Optane memory. Traditional DRAM doesn't support capacity that application developers need and doesn't allow for persistence, and then doesn't provide the speed that a data center demands. Optane data center persistent memory and the second generation Xeon Scalable opened the door for a whole new set of applications. The capacity that we can provide within a single socket and in a single system is just terrific. So for example, we can put four and a half terabytes per socket, which translates to 36 terabytes in an A socket system. That is huge. That's amazing capacity and basically we broke through memory economics bottlenecks. DRAM represents roughly about 60% of system cost. So this is really a big deal. And all this goodness is available both in a traditional data centers and in a public cloud 
and in all of the hybrid versions of a cloud in between. This massive increase in data processing capacity in a single system enables a developing paradigm where a lot of compute will be performed at the edge. Current projections are that in the year 2021, there will be 7 million service delivery edges in addition to 39,000 traditional core data centers. All running new solutions, new workloads, including those for financial services industry, fintech workloads. <coughs> All this investment into compute infrastructure is to make sure we are ready to support innovative solutions. Some of those we are about to learn about today. So please join me in welcoming our competitors and good luck to you guys. Thank you very much, Dan. So let's get up our first set of contestants. This is for category number one, the Banking Enterprise Solutions Crew. So these are fintechs that are here to make processes for banks and financial institutions more efficient, safer, and more centered on their customers. So while I'm giving the introduction, I want the, um, you guys know who you are. So come on up. So we've got uh, Shadi Razak from Sci Nation. We've got Sharon Manton from IM Vision. And we've got Douglas Orr from Nova Stone. One thing to note is that a notable um, VC deal in this area last year was Thought Machine. In fact, in 2018, there were seven venture capital deals in the UK in the enterprise software. So I think we're all ready to go. Off you go. Thank you, Edie. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shadi Razak from Signation. I'm the CTO and the co-founder of Signation. Today, I would like to share with you why the UK National Cybersecurity Centre and Gartner have selected us between the top 10 innovative startups in 2019. Signation specialises in digital risk management. Our proprietary AI help organisation to manage the different digital risks that they have whether if it was cyber, regulatory compliance, financial crime, or news or reputation, all in one platform. Digital transformation bring a lot of opportunity to the business, new ways of generating revenue and acquiring clients. However, at the same time, it brings a new level of complexity to risks. If it's left unmanaged, organizations will face a huge amount of losses. The financial sectors on its own have lost $23 billion in the last year. Two thirds of these losses comes from the fact our current processes of silo and static risk management that goes around, as well the lack of visibility of the digital risk from our digital ecosystem. SciDesk offer an end-to-end -end solution for digital risk management. It's provide the enterprise with a consolidated real-time view of their risk and advanced analytic that seamlessly integrate in the current solution that the organization use for their operation. It's aggregate hundreds of external um, digital risk indicators as well as internal, it's interpreter, and assess it according to the industry um, benchmark and provide the enterprise with real-time risk insights. Now the platform continuously monitor these type of risk indicators every 24 hours and update the organization. This will help a lot of our clients, such as this European bank, who finally get a consolidated real-time view of the digital risk performance of their six subsidiaries in six countries. But what is more interesting, they managed to identify a, and eliminate a three million euro fraud operation that was running by two of their suppliers and their online system. Sounds good, too good to be true. Here's some of the enterprises who trusted our innovation and tested it. On top of all of that, Signation is different. We're not that millenniums. We pride ourselves with the depth and breadth of our senior management experience. It attracted the general former, um, the former general manager of NATO to join our board. 
Signation is the future for digital risk management. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jerome Mantin. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of uh, I'm Vision. And surprisingly, I'm here to speak with you about APIs today. Um, before, before doing that, a few words about us. Uh, we are a fully or purely API security company, a fast-growing company uh, that already has a global uh, uh, Fortune 500 custom, um, on our customer base. Uh, so we were, I think we were talking all in the last uh, two days about APIs, how APIs are crucial, how APIs has an impact on the financial institution. I'm sure we all understand that, but we also understand that APIs are extremely vulnerable. And the problem with APIs is mainly categorized in two, two type of categories. One is implementation vulnerabilities, and the other one is logic vulnerabilities. Regardless if it is for implementation reasons or for logic reasons, um, the threats that comes from API has a severe, a potential severe impact on the way we're going to do business in the financial industry in the years to come. What is the reason for that? Why API is so different in terms of uh, um, security uh, purposes from what we used to know uh, so far? If we look at the way we do business so far, we actually opened our assets to the outside world and allow uh, people from the outside to get access into our platform. But, uh, and, and as a result of that, everything about security was around access control. With API, it's different. In APIs, we actually uh, take our assets and put that on the outside. We want as many partners and, and customers to consume our API. That's what API economy is all about, is having as many uh, consumers using our APIs. And that creates the problem, which perfectly understand and, and explain why uh, we see so many bridges on API happening today. What we do in Envision and why we, what we do differently. We realize that it is impossible to secure the API unless we understand them, unless we understand what are the business functions and the business processes that those APIs actually implement and are being carried across those APIs. And to do so, we have two options. One is to do reverse engineering to all business functions available in the world not really possible. The other one is to translate APIs into languages, and that's what we do in Envision. We represent API as languages, and then exactly like you can analyze this speech today without doing reverse engineering to our brain, using NLP technology, we are capable to build models that can perfectly characterize the nature and the behavior of those APIs, understand content within a context, and that's the key point. So Nova Stone, a uh, bit of my own life story. When I was in grade nine in Canada, learning how to, I learned how to touch type on a mechanical typewriter. After engineering school, I stood by fax machines. Ten years later, an innovation called CC Mail. And that whole world of correspondence is what I grew up with. My teenage daughters don't recognize that world except as old as my record player. They're in a world of messaging, instant messaging. And this world has conquered whole continents, and Novastone is helping its, our clients make the shift, recognize the shift from a world of correspondence represented by paper, form filling, to a world of conversation. And we give our clients a secure framework to enable these conversations to happen internally and externally. In our evolution over the last four and a half years, banks came to us and said, we love your solution, white labeled, on-premise, all that, but could you talk to our clients who are on WhatsApp and WeChat, because our bankers already are talking to them on WhatsApp and WeChat. We don't want to know about it, but we want to now make it legal. So Novastone has taken its platform and extended it to the most popular uh, IAM platforms out there. All of these things are about cost. This is about cost saving. Novastone has a software bus which allows us to plug into the legacy software that banks own control of spent fortune building and expressing those processes now as a conversation with staff and clients and seeing dramatic cost savings uh, potential. And I've added this to my, this, my normal kickoff slide 
because every C-suite conversation I talk to nowadays, they're talking about the shadow IT problems of millennials uh, using uh, solutions not recorded, typically WhatsApp groups, et cetera. This is an example from one of our installations. It was a pilot in a corporate bank here in the UK. Got a 90% shift from email to chat, Novastone white label chat. They got a 50% drop in the number of phone calls. It was the best pilot they've ever done. <coughs> How we do it, we have a backbone that runs on the data center or the cloud environments of our clients. It's white labeled, it's integrated via the software bus. It's got lots of different characteristics in the product that have come through working with our clients the last couple of years. Lots of corner cases which have no importance to what's up, but of huge importance to uh, banks and clients of Novastone. And we work uh, such so securely that we're now able to do transactions up to a quarter of a million pounds with our clients without callbacks. Huge cost savings, more transactions with clients. Um, really to wrap up, we're, we're focused mostly on Europe and Asia right now. We've now got our first American deployment. Uh, be with us on this revolution. Let's have conversations and not form filling. Thank you. So now we can have a couple questions. One, at least one question. Here we go. Oh yeah, <clears throat> I, I have a question for Shadi. Yeah. Um, you you made a comment on it almost looks too good to be true, and mm -hmm. my question for you was because your your offering and risk coverage seems very broad. Uh, you have cyber, you have compliance, you have other business risks. If you can question one, is there any particularly risk you're really, really good at? And, and B, how, how flexible are you with respect to covering any risk? Or how, how does it work? Because just from your presentation, it seemed a bit, we can do anything, trust us. True, true. Um, thank you, and I love that question. Now, our pedigree is cybersecurity and enterprise systems. We focus on digital risks. Banks, all of our organization, the whole FinTech industry, it is running around IT systems. Any type of these operations that we run do leave a trace and they go through the systems. Now, and that's where we come and we focus. We have flipped the usual auditing process, if you think about it. I'm a recovering auditor and a consultant, let's put it that way. We usually start with the policy and the governance to go down the way to the controls and identify the outcomes. We start at the other way around. We started looking at the outcomes. Because we know what the outcomes should look like if the process is accurate and in compliance. And we move backwards all the way up to match it with the governance. And that's what gives us the flexibility of actually looking at different areas and showing the interrelations between them. A simple example will be you're dealing with a third party that they might have, let's say, a senior manager or a director who we can easily find through the KYB and the KYC type of approach, their relationship with other organizations that have sanctions. But also at the same time, from our criminal footprint, we can easily identify that that person, their email has been hacked on a continuous basis, their credit card is available out there. So there's a high possibility of a fraud invoicing that might happen because that person, their position, they can influence these type of decisions moving forward. This is a simple example of the abilities that we can do. We are more of a big data analytics platform that focus on risk. Okay, thank you very much. Right, let's give these guys a huge round of applause. And while we get our next category up on stage, I'd like you to all get your phones out. And this is when you are allowed on your screens. Uh, and do vote for your favorite company in category number one, Banking and Enterprise Solutions. While you do that, let's get category two up on stage. Distributed ledger technology and cryptocurrencies. And my order for here will be Richard Hallowell from Ethical, followed by Nicola Chuparov from Moneyfold, 
and then Chris Lee from Prosper Chain. These companies are coming in a year when we've seen the number of initial coin offerings falling. In January, they'd actually dropped by nearly 95%. However, we are still seeing tremendous interest in what the power of distributed ledger technology can accomplish, from financial inclusion to credit scoring. So I will let you guys take it away. Richard. When I became disabled, I was also the single parent of four young children. And so I know what it's like. I know, I know just how viciously the system works against you if you're unlucky enough to become poor in this country. You see, at that point, you can't get a humanely priced loan uh, or HP or a mobile phone contract or even a decent deal for your gas and electric. It's called the poverty premium, and it's, it's really hurting over 14 million people here in the UK. The problem is that supply decisions for things like loans and mobile phone contracts and so on are made predominantly on the basis of credit history. But credit history is an insane basis for that decision because it actually tells the supplier nothing about affordability. And yet, it's on that very basis that uh, responsible suppliers are having to exclude literally millions of potential customers who all desperately need their services. Sorry, so the ethical solution is a combination of a banking app and a, an integrated forward-thinking uh, credit referencing function all built alongside a, uh, a service aggregation platform. And this works because with an understanding of income and expenditure, uh, the ethical AI can actually calculate current and future affordability. But more important than that, it can validate that independently to potential suppliers. And those suppliers can then use smart contracts on the system for the collection of payments, which reduces the supply risk even further and, uh, and actually also in reduces their, their operating costs. And I whiz through that, I'm probably short of time. So we have an incredibly talented and experienced team, including the, uh, the former chairman of the Money Advice Service, the chief marketing officer from the Royal Mint, and some of the leading lights in blockchain and frontier technologies. We're also working in partnership with, uh, with local government, uh, closely as well with uh, financial service providers and, and leading charities in this sector. But I'm here because we're looking for startup funding of about two and a half million pounds, please. Uh, we're projecting a payback period of less than two years and year three profits in the order of about 60 million pounds. So thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Nikola Chuparov. I'm co-founder and CEO at Manifold. Our flagship product is providing stable coins that are compliant with regulation. 11 million people in the UK are not satisfied with their bank accounts. Similarly, a large number of small and medium enterprises, 2.4 million or thereabouts, are not satisfied. So uh, it's a bit like this is our immediately addressable market. And it's a bit like these people are saying that they don't like the coffee from the office coffee machine. Well, there's good news. We can now provide you the tools so you can build your own coffee machine anytime, anywhere, and you can make your own coffee. And we call these tools stable coins running on a public permissionless blockchain. And if you look at the traditional approach of building and operating financial services, it's a very resource intensive, very expensive approach. What stable coins allows us to do is allow, they allow us to build and operate those same financial services using a lot less resources. And I'll, I'll briefly go through some of the reasons. If you look at the diagram starting at the top and running clockwise, stablecoins reduced your dependency on outdated infrastructure and IT systems. 
stable coins shrink the delay between initiating a payment and that payment actually settling, the reconciliation needs of uh, financial services using stable coins are much, much uh, reduced. The fraud service is reduced and the per transaction cost of, of, of making a transaction are much, much smaller. So to give you some data, uh, Moneyful com successfully completed the regulatory sandbox uh, run by the FCA here in the UK. We demonstrated settlement times in under one minute globally. Uh, the cost per transaction that we saw were in the range of 1.6 pence, which for comparison, that's 50% cheaper than direct access to FPS, uh, fast payment sy services in the UK. Our stable coins are fully backed and we can provide daily proof of funds. And if you want to interface with plastic payment cards or more traditional payment methods, you can do that. Uh, to give you some examples of what people were building and what we're building with the stable coins, uh, conditional pa uh, payments, such as a payment taking place once multiple authorizations are uh, collected or a payment taking place when some, some external event happens, like package delivery or like winning a, a quiz, let's say. Um, there are a number of uh, other things you can build. Uh, Cross-border payments, I, I want to mention because those are very popular. Uh, doing FX using uh, atomic swaps and also decentralized exchanges, which allow you to transact uh, without having the same counterparty default risk. And uh, we hope you're building some of these things and we hope you're interested uh, in building with us. We are raising funds and we're looking for more partners to run pilots, so come and talk to me. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Lee. I'm the CEO of ProsperTrain. ProsperTrain is a real-time credit analytic and po po uh, prospecting platform which enables small and medium-sized enterprises to share the real-time credit scores and their financial profiles powered by blockchain and open banking API. We aim to become the equivalent of LinkedIn for SMEs. So why do we exist? Because of headlines such as these. Lots of companies use their suppliers as a line of credit. And very often, those suppliers don't receive much warning until they discover their debtors have already gone bust. Although they use a credit management solution to monitor their credit scores, but very often, this solution may not necessarily be necessarily accurate. Here is Maplin as an example. This is a credit score of Maplin a week after it went bust. 64 out of 100 indicates a financially healthy company. So how reliable this credit score really is? Let me introduce you ProsperChain. It's a trusted platform that allows businesses share their real-time credit scores in three simple steps. First, we provide a secure channels to connect to SME's accounting software platform and also their bank accounts. We then calculate their real-time credit scores. We then create and publish their digital fingerprints of their credit score and then financial profile onto blockchain which leaves behind an immutable financial history and credit score. So they can use this financial profile to find new opportunities on our platform. So we have uh, incredible uh, feedback from uh, some of these uh, innovative accountants. They, they have been uh, trialing our products. Our team, on the right hand side, Bruce Cannon, he has a 40 years banking experience and he was the Chief Risk Officer Europe at Texas BC. Myself, I started this venture from University of Cambridge and still supported by them. And I have over 10 years banking IT experience and I led teams as credit risk in the risk and finance IT team. So we are prosper chain. We help every party to prosper in a supply chain. Thank you very much. If when you answer any questions, just to give a second or third company an opportunity. Hi, Richard. I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, a, a company like yours, really social purpose. It's amazing. 
Um, however, you talked about two years and then profitability. Well, what's your commercial model? What, how are you going to drive revenue? And it's a difficult market, you know, to make money in. So to tell us a little bit about that and perhaps about the volumes. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the revenue models are, are quite novel, but, but they already exist. If you think about it, the, um, the credit referencing industry already makes charges. So if somebody walks into a, a mobile phone shop and wants a contract, Vodafone, they'll, they'll run a credit check, and that, that'll cost them some money. So, so, so we're, we're targeting that portion. We're also targeting the portion that's taken from uh, the likes of Money Supermarket and other service aggregators. So, and and that, that's our biggest actual revenue line. Uh, there's others, uh, in-app advertising and so on, but, but predominantly it, it's effectively an introduction service fee model. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did I answer all your questions? Hello. Uh, for Nicola, a question you invite us, uh, invited us all to your platform uh, and start building things with you. How many, how many <coughs> actors do you already have on your platform? Is it already up and running? Yes, so GBP, so Pound Sterling and Euro are already live. And, and uh, so, I mean, we, we did a project with about 20 people in the sandbox, which was okay. to turn a government issued ID into a platform for financial services. So instead of paying by, by Visa or MasterCard, you pay with your ID yeah. online. Uh, we've uh, done proof of concepts on the foreign exchange. So just last week we launched four more currencies and we can support up to 14. And tomorrow we're starting a pilot with an FX company here in, uh, uh, in the city. Uh, so there is, there is interest. Uh, th we're speaking to a variety of businesses that are at a different stage. So for example, there's lending platforms that are interested, but they're not ready for another six months. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing process, yeah. All right, let's give these guys a huge round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Voting is now open for category two for the distributed ledger technologies and cryptocurrencies category. You are allowed to vote while I bring our next category up on stage. Uh, category three is all about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, one of my favorite topics in my last podcast, I actually focused on AI and sustainable development goals. One analyst from McKinsey told me that AI has the potential to spur global growth more than earlier innovations, even like steam power. So let's welcome out, let's welcome up James Flavin from Kite Edge, followed by Samantha Monk. From Outside Insight, we'll give him a round of applause in just a moment. Uh, and then Erez Saf from C. Riscos. Criscos. Criscos? Crisco, exactly. I practiced them all and then I forgot. So thank you very much for coming up and we will let it, now I won't forget to say it this time, voting is now closed for the last category and please give your attention to category three. Hello, um, I'm James Flavin. and I'm the CEO of Kite Edge. And uh, Kite Edge is a knowledge and analytics business. We're supported by key professors at Stanford University's Global Project Center. And we look at two different areas. We look at automation of existing human computer processes, so extraction of content from PDF files. And we also look at insight discovery, which we're going to focus on today. So the question is, what is insight? And insight is many things to many different people, and it comes from many different places. So we have insight that's already recorded in documents. We have insight that's already known by people or comes through communication with people. And of course, there's many new technologies that, that highlight insight to people. But the main point here is that insight is, is not insight unless it relates to the individual. It's, it's just data or information until the point that it meets a specific individual need. And individuals don't always know what insight is. Uh, until they, they start looking for it. And looking for it is a, it's a difficult thing to do. We have many different platforms offering access to information in many different places, and now we need aggregators for aggregators. And indeed, some people have over, four, over 40 passwords to access that stuff. So what we do is we centralize access to, to written information. If it has words, we put it in one central place for respecting existing commercial models, and then we focus on how do we help the individual uh, do their job and, and get rid of the frustrations they have in, in finding insight. 
Now, we heard earlier on about 3% of content being accessed. Most organizations have lots of content, and people tend to access only about 5% of it. So there's huge value in making it easier for people to, to access everything with words in one place. Uh, and of course, many search technologies haven't changed since the late 90s, and uh, there are pros and cons of them. So th th there should be a better way of doing this. So most people think that search has been done, and of course, we're all familiar with services like Google and other search engines, but if it's, a, it's, it's ultimately a popularity contest. They take you to the most popular content. And in a business context, that's not the right thing to do. So we focus on the user, and we help the user answer existing questions they might have, or we help them discover insight that they might not be familiar with. And we do so by using many AI and machine learning techniques rather than a single one that might color the results. So this is an example of a, a knowledge graph that exposes the uh, information within all their documents to allow someone to browse uh, information that might help them uh, discover that new insight. And through doing this, we can not only pull people to the subsections of documents um, that fr from across all of the material, whether it's external or internal, uh, but we can also then uh, build up this knowledge and analytics layer that allows them to understand the internal expert network or people that can help them answer the question because insight comes from, from these many places. It may well be that this particular person could speak to a colleague in New York that they're not familiar with in order to get an answer. And then we engage with people in a number of different ways, whether it's through consultancy to help them understand their existing state, or whether it's helping them with these technologies to put in place the system to take them to the, the insight that's meaningful to, to their employees. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Samantha Monk from Outside Insight. Lovely to meet you all. At Outside Insight, we believe that external data can and should be used to make better investment decisions. And that's the case for uh, big public companies, uh, companies that you're investing in, uh, small companies, whether you're a, uh, a bank or, or a lender. Um, but for this particular presentation, I'll focus on one use case, which is private equity. Um, because private equity um, has a, a particular challenge, which is that they're uh, required to try to identify small to medium-sized businesses um, that have the uh, potential to grow. And they're not given a huge amount of information when making that decision. <coughs> Normally what happens is uh, you know, uh, they'll meet with companies within their private network, um, listen to their pitches, perhaps do a bit of due diligence, um, and then they really have to take a, a punt on which companies are most likely to grow. And while, of course, this works, um, it can, there's always room uh, for improvement. Uh, it's rather an inefficient process. Um, it can be a little bit biased according to who you're speaking to. And also, there's a whole world of opportunities that they're not necessarily being exposed to because they're really confined by their personal networks. And so this is where we would like to challenge the status quo with a data-driven approach. There's data all over the web uh, that companies are leaving behind about themselves. And what we do is we have an enormous data lake uh, of sources, and we use AI to connect the dots uh, between those sources and figure out which companies are most likely to grow. Um, so for example, we might notice a, a signal. Uh, let's say that uh, Airbnb just hires a new CFO who happens to have a lot of experience going public, which could uh, potentially be a leading indicator suggesting that they're considering an IPO, which of course they are. Um, and there are thousands of these signals all over the web. And what we can do is use something very clever called a knowledge graph, which will essentially take all of these different signals, connect them together, look back in the last five years, provide some historical context, and just see wh what do those signals mean and how do we use them to predict what's likely to happen to these companies. So we had uh, one pilot already, which was uh, really cool. Actually, it works, so that's uh, awesome. <laughs> um, we were able to take the deal universe, and uh, we used their previous investments as training data, and essentially uh, were able to uh, customize uh, the predictions according to what was interesting to them and find them some really cool opportunities that they weren't aware of. So we're really excited about the application of this technology, not just for private equity, but also for lending, for um, banking, uh, all across the, the financial spectrum where people need to understand where they should put their money and what kind of companies they should back. So hopefully you guys are excited about that too and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much.
Hi, my name is Erez, and I'm the CEO and founder of Quisco. Coming from Israel with offices in San Francisco, Tel Aviv, and Australia, we provide credit rating for small and medium companies. Now, I would tell you why small and medium companies are important, but there's a guy who did it like two minutes ago, so I'm going to use his words. Trust me, it's important. 75% <laughs> of them, when they apply for a loan, they're getting denied on their application. And we're trying to change this one. The reason that they get denied is the process is still very manual intensive and high cost. And we're trying to make it in a different way. We, we introduced one click onboarding process that's connected to ERP system and banking data. We collect the information, invoices, payments, profit and loss, balance sheet, standardize the data, and run mathematical mo models on top of it, starting with linear regression, but also machine learning algorithm, who build a financial behavioral profile of the company. The result is a fast, uh, fast scoring visual dashboard that you can make a quick decision and provide credit. <laughs> we're not just doing one-time report. We keep on monitoring and ongoing, so we keep tracks about the portfolio. We provide alerts or uh, opportunities down the line. We work with a diverse uh, set of uh, customers from Queensland government in Australia, Fortune 100 company banks in the US, and community banks. We have one line integration. I need to stop for a second. I have time. Uh, it's very easy to integrate. We can start working with you if you're a community bank and a very small with two branches, or if you're a Fortune 100 corporate and you have a lot of uh, assets that you want to manage. Our customers love us, and this is the most important one line I will show from the community bank in Arkansas. The customers to apply online and do the initial process for us save us time and money. And that's the most important. Our team is great. Uh, Dave McAdam comes from Australia with a banking experience, 20 years in Bank of Queensland and ANZ. I myself coming from SAP, I'm more a techie guy, uh, and Elon, the first peer-to-peer -peer lending platform in Israel. We are a award-winning startup, uh, backed by ICBA, the Independent Community Banks of America, uh, Plug and Play, the, the accelerator, and we recently won BBVA uh, open tart competition as the best management credit management tool. I invite you to first vote on the on the phone, Crisco, ask me questions, and join us transforming commercial credit one business at a time. Thank you very much. Questions from the judges with some brief answers from you guys. I have a question for Samantha. Who would you consider to be your competition and how threatened might you be by privacy laws around data privacy, essentially? Mm. So most um, data privacy laws surround um, individual data, um, whereas we're looking at company data. And so it's really a, a different um, ball game uh, in terms of needing to worry about protecting people's privacy. I do think any time AI is involved, it's something you have to be very aware of and very conscious of. Um, but the fact that we're just looking to see information that companies have already publicized and just collecting it nicely using AI means that we don't need to worry too much about that side of things. And as far as our competitors go, um, there are a lot of companies, alternative data companies, that are using social media, news, uh, job postings, and so on to help with, for example, short-term trading options. Um, but when it comes to long-term investments, there aren't so many companies that are involved in this, um, particularly around uh, finding signals, which is what we're particularly focused on. So uh, we haven't found any company that's doing just what we're doing. They might be out there. Um, and if they are, then please tell me about them so I can look them up <laughs> and see what they're up to. But hopefully that answers your question. I'm James. Um, sometimes algorithms go wrong. So how, how sure are we be about our algorithms? Can we t how can we trust you and your algorithms? Um, the, the main point of our platform is we're not reliant on a particular algorithm. That's the problem of all these other search platforms. They take a bet on one particular approach. So we have a process called cognitive, of, cognitive ontology, where we use a selection of machine algorithms, but we also use a traditional knowledge graph and ontology, which, which was built up with two years of us sitting down with domain sector experts and collecting the way they think about their particular sectors alongside traditional queries. 
And instead of using these approaches to second guess the user's intent, we use these um, uh, processes to say to the user, I see you've typed in the Fed. What did you mean by the Fed? Did you mean it within this context or this context or then this context? So by having a narrative, we move people beyond either natural language where the system guesses what their intent is or beyond single keyword searches where they have to read lots of stuff to this environment where we can actually profile their actual interests, which is how that we can build this uh, internal expert network and connect them with people as well as connect them with the subsections of documents. So it's a fundamentally different approach which um, is very supportive of, of algorithmic bias uh, not being a, a problem. So thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Voting is now open for category three, so we'll give you about 30 seconds to give your votes for which company should win there. While I bring up our next category, category four, FinTech for Good. According to the World Bank, there are still two billion adults who, in the world who cannot receive any formal financial services. And to discuss some of the ways that we can help some of these people, we have, and in fact, I'm gonna get them to go one, two, three. Uh, we've got Yunki Yushifura from Do Re Ming. We have Delbert Lage from Salary Fits. And Alex Perrin is my bill fair. Financial inclusion has at its heart the customer, whether they're in the Outer Hebrides, Haiti, or Hawaii. So I'm going to now close voting and we'll give it over to the next category. Category four, off you go. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Junki, Yuki CEO of Dora Ming. Here's a chart about UK in work poverty showing 14% of workers are now actually in poverty. And the underlying issue is the vicious cycle of short-term credit. One third are in short of cash to payday. And almost 50% have less than 100 pounds of saving. And this resulted in 400 billion pounds unsecured debt, such as overdraft or payday loan. This is clearly not unacceptable here in the, uh, in the 21st century UK. So far, a number of solutions have been deployed, but what people say is they don't want to pay when they can't afford their dinner. They don't want to sign up to five different services. And they just simply don't know what to do because no one tells them before they get screwed. So the key is how to be as holistic and inclusive as possible. So we have to reach out to those who are not a big fan of fintech or app store, for example, middle-aged people or housewives, the big labor market entrant in recent years. Dormin can be a solution. Firstly, we partner with the employer and provide money account and payment measure to employee. So the key feature of this money account is that when the payday is far, they can get salary advance up to the earned amount after tax at any time, any frequency, all for free. And on, as another pillar, we provide budgeting and saving functions also for free. And this is really important for them to, so that they don't lose their control. Also, we're building the uh, loans and insurance services also through employer partnership. So in this way, we are creating this single point of access to the full suite of financial services so that they, they can address the full cycle of customer pain point. And to realize this, we provide our HL system to employer with its uh, real-time take-home pay ca calculation function. We monetize from downstream services, such as uh, merchant fees, which are, of course, for free for the users, and the on-demand services, when, uh, which are they, of course, willing to pay when they need it. Uh, the, unlike Dora Ming, existing banking sol solutions are not uh, tailored for this poverty problem. There's a growing number of wage advance or employee benefit programs, but none of them realize this free of charge essential service packages, including salary advance, like us here at Dora Ming. We launched in Japan and Vietnam with a good initial traction and targeting to enter the UK market, tar uh, initially targeting the 300,000 customers. And the team is a uh, strong mixture of finance and IT and HO background, uh, bonded together so strongly uh, with our passion to in uh, promote financial inclusion. And in the end, uh, I'd like to emphasize that the time is now for UK, given everything Brexit labor shortage, universal credit shortfalls, and uh, payday loan collapse, and fintech opportunity as we see today. Thank you very much. Most of you came here today to find the next billion dollar opportunity. 
And in order, in order to do so, perhaps we should start looking at the billion dollar problems. There are 1.7 billion unbanked individuals in the world. And most of the individuals who do have a bank account have a hard time having access to fair financial products and services, leaving actually paycheck to paycheck. That is not only true in Europe, but actually anywhere in the world. And you know, life needs are credit needs. And individuals who usually need it the most are the ones who do not have access to it. I could tell you my story when I moved from Brazil to London and had a hard time trying to ass assess credit. But I'm not going to do that because I would ruin my recently acquired three years of credit history. So I'm not going to do that, definitely. But the question is, why is that? Reason for that is actually on the cost of acquisition of consumers and on the friction that financial institutions have accessing their ability to pay and willingness to pay. But the truth, I truth is most of those individuals might not have a prime relationship with a bank, but they do have a, a stable job. And imagine if they could come to the financial institution and say, look, this is my salary, this is my employment relationship, and my employer is going to support me by deducting the repayments from my salary. Imagine that there are millions of those consumers and if we could empower them through their salaries. That's why we have partnered with more than 80 financial institutions worldwide to allow them to have access to individuals, understand who they are, understand their salary information, and have the reliability of receiving the payments through their salaries. With our infrastructure, employees can have access to a wide range of products, such as loans, investments, insurance products, and much more creating an actual win-win scenario where employers are supportive and careful for the financial well-being of their employees, employees have access to better credit, and financial institutions find lower transaction costs and cost of acquisition, all through a cost-free solution for employers and employers. And you know, this is not just a smart idea that came out of my pocket right now. We've been doing that in Brazil, uh, where we manage more than $18 billion in loans and $5 billion on other products. We also have a uh, scale-up operation in Mexico, and we have onboarded more than 400,000 employees already in UK with three years of operations. This is actually about changing and impacting people's lives. Uh, if you take the le average level of indebtedness of an individual in UK, we are saving more than 1,500 pounds in e interest repayments, and that's what we have been doing for more than 3.5 million right now. So if you're an investor, a company, or a financial institution willing to promote sustainable change, it's time to talk. My name is Delber, and we are Sally Fitz. Hi, I'm Alex from uh, Is My Bill Fair. We exist to solve the problem of the loyalty penalty in which loyal, long-standing customers pay far more than new customers in categories such as energy, broadband, and mobile. Until now, the only answer has been to switch, and an entire industry has grown to support that, worth billions, uh, with lots of household names. But despite being worth billions, these switch sites fundamentally miss the point, because most people don't want to switch, they just want to pay a fair price, and our service is for the 79%. Firstly, we help you check if you were paying a fair price by showing you how your price compares to what other people are paying the same provider for the same service. <laughs> and then if you are being overcharged, we help you challenge your provider to give you a fairer deal for staying with them. The market potential in, here in the UK is huge. There are over 100 million subscriptions in our existing four categories, and tens of millions more in adjacent categories that we're moving into. And of course, the potential around the world runs into billions. It's a simple 60-second journey, and it's free. You click buttons uh, to state who you are with and what you've got in your package. And our priceometer then shows how your price compares to the high, low, and average. And the data for this priceometer comes from previous users like you. If you want to challenge your provider, enter some simple details, and we'll issue the challenge on your behalf. Our revenue model is for companies to pay us a low fee for each customer we help them retain. Every year, big companies spend hundreds of millions each to stand still in terms of customer volume. And that's because 
Every customer who switches away needs replacing at a cost of up to £250 each. Instead, we identify and intercept customers before they switch, so our model of fix and retain undercuts their existing switch and replace cost. We've already had great results. Our volumes are snowballing, uh, driven by social media, uh, PR and advocacy. And most importantly, 75% of users have been given a fairer deal, meaning that so far, we've actually saved people now over six million pounds. The byproduct of our service is hugely valuable data. So we can help partners see exactly what their customers are buying, but also how price sensitive they are and what their churn propensity is. Our partnership with uh, the Daily Mail Group is signed, and uh, people in the room can talk to me about becoming our retail banking partner. Uh, in summary, switching serves two in 10, we serve eight in 10, we've saved people millions, and I think that really is FinTech for good. Here's my billfair.com. Thanks guys. Uh, Delba, I've got a question for you. There are tons of salary finance solutions in the market. How are you different? How are you going to continue to be better than the competition? We are actually the infrastructure to allow them to scale themselves. We never provide the products or the services ourselves. So that's why we partner with financial salary finance, neighbors, uh, wage stream and the others of the like to allow them to acquire those consumers. Okay, so you're the rails. Any more questions from our judges? I can yeah. ask another question. Mm -hmm. um, is my bill fair? If you are successful and you disrupt the world, am I going to end up paying more overall as a customer of these companies? No. Every year, millions of pounds um, leaks out of the energy industry or the broadband industry to support the current cycle of churn and replace. So money that should be being spent on faster broadband for you or new power stations is going out of those industries um, into switching industries through them into Google and to ITV, etc. So actually, we should all be better off. We should all be getting fairer deals. Great. Thank you very much. Give these guys a huge round of applause. <laughs> Category four, FinTech for good. So I'm going to open the voting now so you can whip out your phones and vote for your favorite company, for category four, FinTech for Good, while I call up our next group. Category number five, Payments and Financial and, and FX. This category has been at the heart of the FinTech revolution since 2008, 2009, for both people and businesses. So can we please welcome up Ro Robert Atkin from Banking Portal, followed by Daniel Blondell from McClear, and then we've got Valeria Bahorowska from Fondi. If you take money transfer, FX, and payments together, just in the United Kingdom, we saw 28 deals last year worth $166 million. Got your order right? So. Well done, team. All right, off you go. Oh, sorry, voting is now closed. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Robert Atkin. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, the, the uh, Open Banking Portal. Uh, I'm here to talk to you briefly about um, open banking from a business perspective rather, f rather than from a con consumer perspective. Uh, all the sort of information I've seen so far is uh, aimed at consumers. Um, but there's some very significant advantages to uh, businesses engaging with um, open banking. So. Uh, there's a very short video now, um, which will kind of give you a quick snapshot, and then I'll just carry on briefly after that. Okay, so now you're all experts, so questions later. <laughs> so um, we're a payment gateway. Uh, but we connect to open banking rather than the traditional um, card payment systems. Uh, we've team behind the system, uh, have a, a lot of experience, um, and uh, some of the uh, software we've developed has, has won the awards that you can see. Um, so open banking, benefits versus cards, extremely low fees. Um, instant settlement, 
Certain industries benefit from specific um, um, features of open banking. Um, so if you're in FX, for example, and you have instant, settl <coughs> instant settlement, uh, that enables you to release funds much quicker than if you're waiting for payments on cards. This is an example of uh, what a typical merchant, uh, typical being in inverted commas, uh, might expect to save by switching from card payments to uh, open banking. So um, this is a, a merchant, uh, it was done for a gambling merchant who does 100 transactions a day at 100 pounds, um, utilizing uh, a typical um, payment cost of uh, five pence plus 2%. You can fiddle with the fees as much as you like. In fact, we have a, an application on the site there. You can see the URL where you can go in and put in your own uh, figures to, uh, to work it out. So currently on that, on that basis, uh, this merchant is paying £74,000 in the payment uh, transaction fees. If he switches to us, it's £9,000. Or is it eight? £9,000 in this one. So uh, a, a, a massive saving in uh, transaction costs. So it's not something that people are going to do overnight, but you can gradually move into it. But if you're an FX company, again, if you say to your clients, what if you use open banking to pay us, we can release the funds uh, in your dollars or whatever the currency you're buying. Um, we're actually talking to a company uh, in prepaid cards at the moment who, for the same thing, they want uh, instant load into their um, wallets uh, so that, that, that uh, their customers can spend the money immediately rather than having to wait for time for it to clear. <laughs> open banking is a, is a new business model. Uh, within the banking portal... Afternoon, everybody. Um, so first of all, um, we at McClear are passionate about wearable technology, and in particular, uh, we have a clear focus on our smart ring. So I thought I'd give you some key facts, first of all, to tell you a little bit more about who McClear are. So we were the catalyst behind the smart ring industry in 2013 with the NFC ring. And since then, we have 46 patents pending, um, covering countries such as Singapore, Canada, Australia, the UK, and Europe. We have five patents that are issued with three sub-patents pending underneath that, which is filed within the US. We have 18 trademarks, um, which are all pending. And our goal, we've always been quite passionate about data security and having your data on the hand of the beholder. Our smart ring is the first smart ring that was developed and manufactured and engineered from the ground up. Um, and we're a London-based company, so people would think that with a smart ring, we would be predominantly focused on manufacturing, but we're not. We are very passionate about providing additional services that make you want to wear our ring and continually wear our ring and enjoy the services that that provides. How do we do this? Well, we take small pieces of friction that you don't know that exists and converge that into a single form factor. Whether that's taking your keys for your house or for your office or for your car and converging that into a device that's able to access all of those uh, touch points. We've already taken payments and made our ring uh, into a contactless payment device. We'll soon be financially including children. So if you are a parent in this room, you should be able to gift your children with pocket money um, and allow them to spend that um, in a form factor that's uh, built into our ring. We'll soon be announcing our partnership with a company called Live Nation, so live events. And we're gonna be converging ticketing and not just single access ticketing, but we'll also be making that a multi-ticket um, um, device that's reprovisionable. And we'll be launching a biometric <coughs> passive version of our ring, um, which will also get around the issue of having low value payments. We're often asked why we are a, pass a passive ring company and why we've never worked in the active field. Uh, and the answer is quite simple. We can technically squeeze in batteries and components that will make our ring active, but that will put our ring at a price point that competes with something like a smartwatch. Uh, and a smartwatch will have many more features than our ring ever could, um, given the fact that it has a graphic or a screen for 
consumers to interface into. So we will always be a, a passive device. And if you think back to the convergence of ticketing and access, it's not bad for a ring that's just passive and doesn't have any active capabilities. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Valeria and I'm a CEO and founder of co uh, company Fonti. So just one question, how do you think if it is easier for small and middle sized entrepreneurs in e-commerce to be cost effective? No, that is why we decided to create a payment platform as a payment hub. What does it mean? It means that uh, we wanted to make one integration with our payment gateway using very friendly APIs and you receive on one hand an opportunity to accept payments all over the world using uh, different types of payment methods, different channels and you will have just one point of control of all transactions flow and on the other hand you will have an opportunity to have a multi-currency account and make settlements uh, for suppliers, partners, employees um, and cost-effective way using our financial management. Uh, so we have integration with the card payments, with the mobile payment methods. We have a, a local payment methods for sure using new rules of PSD2, open banking. Uh, we have different currencies and we can make an, um, settlements in, in a currency of authorizations. Uh, and for sure, uh, clients can pay in the web, in mobile phone, in TV. We develop mobile application and uh, in sales of points, uh, points of sales, uh, people can use NFC payments and all this information will be shown on the dashboard in online and uh, small entrepreneurs, they can uh, first of all create different types of reports and uh, different types of information they can receive online and check. Uh, also in our dashboard, uh, you can receive information and see the, the map of your consumers, how they pay in which one uh, countries, in which one methods, which one devices uh, and if you don't have any access to uh, your laptop, it's not a problem because uh, we develop a mobile application where you can also on, in online check all transaction flow, but also you can use uh, this mobile application to, set, to send uh, online invoices to your partners and also for sure to consumers. Um, and based on this all information about transaction, we built financial uh, management and uh, first of all we focused on automatization of all kind of payments. Uh, it is split of the payment it is payments calendar uh, because we understand how often do you pay to which one supplier and you can um, make that is what we can make for you calendar and uh, after that you just need to confirm such kind of payments uh, for sure we work with the fix fix and uh, with the multi currency accounting and we make the some recommendations and we show how often uh, do you make some changes and we make the recommendation uh, maybe you need to change my uh, that's all <laughs> thank you Great. I have a question for Daniel. Uh, Daniel, you, you've, you've got the form factor, which is the ring, but Correct. it looks like you've got a lot of integrations and a lot yeah. of technology, and you mentioned, uh, I think it was 46 patents. Yeah. So, so how much of that is tied to the form factor versus some of the other technology that you've got uh, in there? Yeah, so good question. So the, the patents really are around the form factor itself and the communication protocol to <coughs> other devices. So the patents are particularly focused on our form factor, the shape, the material that we make that in communicating to other devices. Um, how does that fit with the other services? So most of the other services are API driven. So the ticketing, for instance, the ticketing engine. Um, in order to make most of the ticketing stuff work, we've been working with our banking partners and our payment network partners <coughs> to provide a tokenization service. So that's a passive device that's sent to your home that has a provisioning mechanism that allows the ring holder to tokenize the card they have in their wallet in the comfort of their own home. Using that same mechanism, you're then able to provision your credentials for your event and reprovision for future events as well. Uh, Valeria, what would you describe as your, your one single biggest differentiator to all other uh, payment solutions out there? Uh, could you repeat what uh, it's like I, I understand your your application but to me it looked similar to other 
First of all, it's not application because yeah. uh, it has also a web. Uh, we have a dashboard and yeah. uh, it's uh, online integration and yeah. you have an ac access and you can download everything in online. And uh, if your question is, is quite similar to others, no, because we provide not just the payments here. Yeah? Uh, we created a, a generally automatization of payments and a lot of different types of reports for entrepreneurs and the small in size because unfortunately they don't have any financial teams and accountant teams sometimes and use every time in outsource services this and we provide to them you can make everything in your team and that is why because in our dashboard uh, mobile application is just like if you don't have an access to laptop but everything it is in a dashboard we provide first of all services uh, of account like an accountant and also of financial because you can see what is your financial situation uh, what is your turnover what is your profit and everything because we collect all this data and we combine everything thank you very much let's give these guys a round of applause <laughs> voting is now open for category five foreign exchange and payments. And while I let you guys peruse your screens and vote for your favorite company there, I'm going to invite up the next category. We've got category six, peer-to-peer -peer lending, alternative funding, and SME landing. And I'm gonna invite Jonathan uh, Wigan from Pioneer to come here. We've got Mariano Kostelak from Student Finance, and Andres Iragara, Iraraga from Kresge. Did I do that all right? That's fine. All right. <laughs> uh, now, this part of FinTech has seen enormous growth this year. At the end of 2018, we saw 20 million crowdfunded into challenger bank Monzo in just two days, two hours, and 45 minutes. So the companies today are all cracking open lending and investment to new audiences. I'm going to close voting now for the previous category, and we will hand over to you guys. So annual global investment into the built environment that we live, love, work, and die in is $1.4 trillion. But just 500 investors account for more than 84% of that figure. That's less than a quarter of the number of delegates here today. Institutional investors allocate 10% of their portfolios to property, but most of us can't because property investment is complex, opaque, expensive, and inefficient and existing solutions offer limited choice and diversification. So we created a regulated online global pro uh, marketplace for property where developers can raise money and ordinary mortals can invest small amounts in pre-vetted projects from across all property sectors and geographies with both yielding assets for regular income and development opportunities for capital gains. Our first market is the 7 million UK households with over 150,000 pounds income, and then the 300 million mass affluent individuals worldwide who get a sleek, friendly user interface with fully, with fully automated onboarding and clear, detailed project information, and a fully fo featured user, um, user dashboard where you can create your own diversified personal portfolio of international fractional real estate assets as easily as investing in stocks and shares. We align our interests with those of our clients by taking most of our fees in the form of a profit share with just a small commission taken from amounts invested and rental yields. And we are targeting annual revenue of 18 million pounds by 2021 generated from users across Europe which we think is achievable given that the total opportunity is up to $1.4 trillion and that our closest competitors are stuck at real estate crowdfunding 1.0. While we have a regulated platform with payments in 26 currencies, a pipeline of international deal flow and the technological vision to make liquid real estate investment a reality. And looking to the future, we are already working on predictive data analysis tools for asset selection, the pioneer innovative finance ISA and secondary market, and the pioneer API for integration into wealth management apps. It's a lot to do, but my two decades in institutional investment, property, and award-winning startups is supported by 18 years of development experience and advisors with a background in regulation, technology, and 40 years of property investment. But we need your help and are raising an SEIS round of £150,000 to support our go-to-market. 
so that we can seize this opportunity to help individuals achieve greater financial well-being and turn 500 property investors into 500,000. Thank you. The education system that we created is broken. Fixing this will cost trillions of dollars to society in the next generation. We as society are investing billions of dollars every year into education programs in areas that don't have demand or won't exist in a couple of years. 75 million people won't have jobs in the areas that they studied, while at the same time, 133 million new jobs are being created mostly in technology and digital areas. This is creating a huge skills gap, and education today is being too slow to adapt. Student finance is born to accelerate the global transformation of the workforce for the digital economy. We invest in students' education, and we index our return on their success, so we only succeed when they succeed. Let's see how this works. So with student finance, we cover the cost of your tuition fee in exchange of a share of your future income. And you only start making payments after getting a job and earning above a minimum amount. So if you don't get paid, we don't get paid. And that's how we, that's how we make sure that our interests are 100% aligned. This is really the premise of the income share agreement model. We also have a large network of employer partnerships in place to make sure that every single student that we invest in, we place them into a job. We are also innovating on how financial institutions assess credit risk for consumer financing. We evaluate students based on their, their potential to succeed, and we pass the burden from the individual to the quality of the school. So with student finance, you don't need to prove that your dad is rich, but rather than the school is good, and will maximize your chances of getting a job. We are supporting real and powerful life transformations here. With the schools that we partner with, the average student sees a 50% increase in salary after finishing the program. So why are we the best team to deliver? We've got experience in both the student market and the financial sector. We co-founded companies in the education space. We've raised tens of millions in funding. We've reached millions of students. And we work for some of the top financial institutions in the world. So with student finance, we invest in the best digital skills, boot camps, and courses in the market while solving the skills gap with a fair and sustainable model for the future. Thank you. I've been thinking through how FinTech platforms could best support sustainable economic development. Cressy, what we think is the first social impact lending platform is our answer. We currently have operations in Colombia with plans to expand throughout the Americas. Cressy lends to social impact entrepreneurs working to solve some of the world's most pressing goals, most pressing problems. Problems that have been categorized across the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Our platform categorizes those goals into three groups, projects that impact positively impact individuals, communities, and the environment. So when an entrepreneur comes onto our platform, he or she fills out a questionnaire that will determine if their project is a social impact one as we have defined it. And our platform will give that project a social impact score. We're working to position the social impact score as a valuable marker for our companies as they look to strengthen their brand in the marketplace as an impact company. And for our own investors, the social impact score will serve as confirmation that their investment can have pro-social benefits without sacrificing a return. Once the social impact filter is passed, our platform then conducts a credit risk analysis and a lending decision is made. We're also looking for innovative ways that the public at large could participate directly into our projects. We're looking to set up an online platform where investors could buy social impact Cressy bonds that track the performance of our portfolio. Let me give you two examples of our portfolio. Sago, seen here, is a company that recycles and repurposes shipping containers, creating beautiful living spaces, and they've also created restaurants and mobile hospitals in remote areas of Colombia. Agroaguas is a company that builds clean water infrastructure. 
It used the Cressy loan to build an aqueduct in a small town in a post-conflict zone of Colombia. Worldwide, we see there's been 500 billion assets earmarked for impact investing, 36 billion just for Latin America. And premier financial institutions are investing heavily in Latin American fintechs. We're working to take advantage of these two trends to serve a need for social impact entrepreneurs that is 22 billion just in Colombia. And we have a great team position to do so. We're legal, financial, operations, and technology prof professionals that come from the world's brand name academic and professional institutions. Cresi is a, is a play on the word Cresi, which means to grow in Spanish. We hope that our entrepreneurs can say, with Cresi, they grew. And you all could be the support and the private capital that makes all the difference. Thank you very much. Any questions from our judges? Of course, I have to have one for, um, <laughs> for uh, student finance for um, Mariano. Yeah. So, um, how does how does uh, how do you keep from getting the most the students that are most likely to earn the least? Because it, it seems like it'd be an easy thing to self-select into into your program if I'm at the bottom end of the. Uh, the, the, uh, the programs? Yeah, so our model is that we actually work directly with specific schools. We qualify the schools based on their performance metrics, which means everything around what are the, what's the admission process, what are the drop off rates, how many students graduate, and what are the employment salary projections. You know, so you really make sure that the schools that you work with are really strong on that perspective, and only students from those programs can actually onboard to our, um, apply for our financing. Um, so that's how we do it. So we don't have direct, uh, let's say, Open to, we don't have a platform directly open to random students to, to come to us and apply. Any other questions from our esteemed judges? Yeah. But perhaps Andres. Um, who's taking the credit risk in the end? I saw you, you on the right with Goldman Sachs, it was, I guess. Is that actually them taking the credit risk? And, and what, how do you then justify a premium to you? Okay, so, so Goldman Sachs is an example of a, of a company that's investing heavily in Lamar fintechs. They haven't invested directly into us. So we take the credit risk in, in two different ways. If you buy one of our impact bonds, we as a company take the credit risk and the exchange rate risk depending on where you're investing. If we're looking to set up a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism where you can invest directly into the project and then you will get a higher return but take on the exchange rate and credit risk. And one last mm -hmm. one maybe for Jonathan. Um, you made the strong statements on we're going to have uh, liquid uh, real estate investments. So can you just briefly, what, how will you manage the liquidity? And sure. Well, it's all about creating, everyone hear me, yeah? Um, it's all about creating real market depth. So one of the things that we're doing towards that end is we're creating data analysis tools which we can offer to create value for our project sponsors so that they can... <coughs> Um, they can select market beating assets. We're hoping what this will do is create a virtuous circle where it becomes the de facto choice, the, the most intelligent choice to raise money with us. And these uh, higher returns will be passed on to our users, meaning that we will have more users. And once we reach a critical mass, we'll then have enough people that we can start actually having that liquid market. It's all about the market depth, really. And what's your time frame? Um, well, we're looking to on. We're we're planning to onboard ten thousand users over the next two two years. And that provides. We think that will be enough. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Let's give these guys a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. So I'm gonna, now going to open uh, voting to you guys for category six. That was peer to peer lending alternative financing, tone of funding, and SME land lending. Now we're going to bring up category seven, and I'm going to ask uh, for Jonathan Dreschler from RecordSure to come, Ritesh Singhania, Clear Glass, and then Andrea McGeehan from Trakti. This is an area, this is a category which has really been trending this year. Uh, these are companies that can work with both small and large players in the market, and it's worth recognizing that last year's winner from Pitch360 actually came from this technology, came from this area. Exate Technology is a data privacy firm that operates within RegTech. So I am going to leave it over to you. We've got Jonathan, you're ready to start. Sure. 
Okay, I'm going to close voting now for the previous category, and we will let you carry on. Uh, my name is Johnny Drexler. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm introducing you to a business called RecordSure. Uh, RecordSure was effectively born out of uh, what we felt was a gap in the market around recording face-to-face -face financial customer transactions. Uh, and that was based on our experience of doing a lot of large-scale remediations, where you're effectively doing file-based reviews to try and determine whether or not customers have been missold to. And more often than not, you'll end up coming down on the side of the customer, not because they were missold to, but because you couldn't evidence that you'd sold appropriately in the first place. So we said there's a bit of a broken system there. Let's fill the gap and start creating an authoritative record of what gets said at the point of sale. We then said, if we're going to create all of those recordings, what could we do with them to make the life of the compliance team, the risk team, the sales and training teams, what could we do to make their lives more efficient and more effective? And could we use some really cutting edge artificial intelligence to give us a line of sight into those conversations, whether our customer facing staff are conducting themselves appropriately, delivering a good customer experience, and uh, what did that interaction look like? Uh, recognizing there was a cultural change that comes with recording face to face, we also made sure that our AI could be applied to telephony interactions, video conferencing, and more recently we we're applying it to written channels of communication as well. So you can start to string all your customer interactions together, analyze them uh, from the point of view of the entire customer journey and see if you've done all the things that you should be doing. Uh, to do this, effectively what we've done is taken a team of leading speech and language scientists, many of which are based out of Cambridge. We've combined them with uh, domain expertise within the financial services sector to build some really bespoke speech analytics software for the financial services market. Uh, one of our major use cases is effectively organizations being able to apply this technology to 100% of their interactions, flag the most at-risk interactions, and uh, review those interactions in a much more efficient way than they currently can. And that's versus the current approach, which is a random sampling approach where you're doing very well to look at 5% of the interactions that flow through your business. Uh, we come from a compliance background, but increasingly it is sales, it's training and competency teams that are buying this capability off us to give insight around how are staff performing, what's customer sentiment like, what else could we be doing. Uh, we're delivering, delivering this capability to some of the largest retail banks in the UK, wealth managers, IFA networks. We've also got the UK government using the capability now to record some of the most sensitive interviews that take place within the Home Office and we're expanding um, quickly into initially other English-speaking territories, so Australia and North America, uh, but with plans to translate into the 35 most spoken languages in the world. Thank you very much for your time. Look forward to speaking. Hello, hi, my name is Ratesh, and I'm the co-founder of Clear Glass. The problem that we are solving here is pension funds who struggle to get a complete picture of how much are they paying their underlying asset managers. If you think about the problem, these pension funds are responsible for investing billions and billions of pounds of our money, and the impact that it has on our retirement is crazy. And the fact that they don't have a complete picture of how much are they paying their underlying asset managers is a scary thought. The reason of this problem is the asset owners or the pension funds do not have a standard framework from the regulator which they can use to ask data from their underlying asset managers. So what happens is that asset managers would use a framework that they feel con convenient about. And if I'm the trustee of a pension scheme and if I'm sitting in an annual meeting, I've got data from 10 different asset managers and there's no way for me to compare on a like-to-like -like basis. So what happened was in 2017, the FCA intervened and set up an independent group to set up a framework. The group was chaired by the co-founder of Clear Glass, Chris Sear, and they came out with a framework last year which was approved by the industry. As a, as a result of that framework, what happened was the biggest pension scheme in the UK, which is the local government pension scheme, managing 260 billion of assets, have decided to expel asset managers who do not want to adhere to the code of transparency. So to give you an example of what kind of a benefit we can see, one of the government pension schemes, which is 11 and a half billion, they thought that they were paying the asset managers 11 odd million, 
And when they went through the exercise, they realized they were paying eight times, which is 87.3 million. And as a result of that, they could negotiate their price down to 69.8 million. In terms of the impact and the way they like to speak about it is that as a result of that, they could save six public libraries in <coughs> Birmingham. So at ClearGlass, what we do is that we provide the asset managers the underlying technology to share the data with their pension schemes using the standard framework that was released by the FCA last year. We've launched our product uh, this year in January, and since, since launch, we are managing data for about 100 billion of assets, working with 100 plus asset managers, and these are the asset managers who are managing about 80% of the assets in the UK, and have already assessed 500 funds on our platform. Why are we the best people to solve the problem? So Chris on the left-hand side chaired the FCA body which wrote the standard. He's also UK's FinTech envoy. Kunal on the right-hand side, I started my first company with him when he was 16, he's 22 now. And about me, God knows how many times I've failed in my life, but I'm determined to make this my success story. Thank you. Hi there. So I'm here to talk about a process that I imagine most people in the room will have gone through the frustrations of. And somebody else talked before about something being broken. How we manage and negotiate contracts, no matter what the industry, it is broken because it is frustrating. It affects millions of people. It takes up a lot of our time. I don't know how many of you are like me trying to track changes and who said what and try to understand what it is that I'm looking at in that contract and how much time I spend at weekends trying to get that through. And of course there's a cost, it's expensive to be able to deal with it. And with increased compliance issues, especially from an international perspective, that cost is rising but has to be dealt with for the obvious reasons. This chart is literally showing how businesses are recognizing that the cost to handling contractual negotiations is rising. So what do Tracti do? Tracti has actually taken a static, broken process and bring it into something that works seamlessly. It's not just a DocuSign, which is a digital signature. It's not just a storage box, which is where I can go and find all those contracts. It's an end-to-end -end process. So they created a platform that operates for everybody. You, if you're using the platform, can create your own templates up and operate elements within there that could be the rate that you're going to charge, and that rate could actually be put into a smart contract using blockchain or DLT, whatever name you want to use it, which triggers people to be invoiced, charge other payments, etc., bring in all sorts of benefits of time, cost, and halving the risk issues that you can see in the compliance side. Everything is kept all in a secure platform. Every detail, every KYC, every price, every process is kept within the platform. But the people who use the platform are doing so in a, in a smart manner on the user experience and everything at the back end is making everything come together and trackable. And addendums nowadays can now just be the one element. This particular price has changed and that's the element to it. 15 paying customers. There's the Italian Air Force, there's payments companies, there's a whole host of different businesses actively using this and growing. I'm actually one of them. One of my um, clients uses this. I'm on the board, but I'm not actually the founder, and I was asked to come and present to you as the actual user seeing the benefits of it. And it does work. A number of awards have been coming through, and the guys are committed to just making this better and better. Thank you. Um, thank you. I have a, a question for uh, Ritesh. Um, to question, I applaud what you're doing, uh, super. But I, I'm wondering how future-proof is this uh, is this business? And I might be naive, but I think with a more transparent charging policy, all your good work wouldn't be needed. So. So when you talk about the future proof, you mean what's the future of the business model? Yeah. Absolutely. So what happens is that once you get to a point where you've got a certain volume of data, you start doing benchmarking with the data. Where you start telling people <coughs> that 
the data that has come in is what you're paying is not within the tolerance range. You're paying more than the industry benchmark. So you start building value-added products based on the power of data that you've gathered in the first few years. So it's the value-added products leveraging data that you could build. Uh, I have another one, if I can, for uh, Lui Luigi. Yes. But oh, you are the. Uh, uh, given you you are a client, I think that's that that's very interesting. I just wanted to hear your experience on how easy it was to to onboard Trakti because there's a lot of documents and data, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that's usually the the the, the crux. Yes. Yeah. At the beginning learning and getting everybody on board on how to do that. You do invest some time, but you are using the contracts that are yours already. So you're actually bringing your contracts into the platform. So the elements that's the smart side, you're just working with Tracty to say that this is something that's a variable and I want it to be validated and therefore automated to pay. So it's not as, it's not as difficult as it sounds because you're using your own contracts, putting it into the platform. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. And I will now open voting for category number seven, RegTech, just to remind you all. And now we're going to have our final category, which is personal finance and robo advice. These are companies which are very consumer focused, technology, where people should be trading, who they should be getting their energy from. So we're going to invite up now Ruzbe Basha from City Falcon, Andrew Long from Switchcraft, and Darius Kumana from Risk. A lot of challenger banks are integrating robo advice <laughs> into their offerings, and so I'm interested to hear what you all have to say. I'm now going to close voting for the previous category, number seven, RegTech, and we will Leave it over to you, Ruzba, take it away. Let me start with a quick question. How many people think um, knowledge is power in your decision making? This is what we do. There are two key problems we are solving. One is if you're tracking something really popular, be it an Apple stock or even artificial intelligence today, there's a lot of information. At the other hand, if you want to track something which is you know, a small company in, it in Italy, you're not going to get any information. These are the problems we are solving. Now just imagine the experience you get on Google, on Google News, and similar platforms, and change that from reading news to focusing on insights, focusing on stuff that's relevant for you. This is what we do. Imagine the experience when you're looking, a page, looking at a page on Apple, and it's focused on insights. It's focused on sentiments rather than just a long feed of information. Same with artificial intelligence. If I can tell you today, in the last one day, the focus was healthcare in China, it reduces how much you need to consume today. Consume today. So what do we do? We convert unstructured data into structured content. So this is using natural language processing in multiple languages, including difficult languages like Russian. A Lot of forms are still filled by hand we can convert that into structured data. Why structured data matters? Think about it. Don't you want everything in Excel to be able to do pivot tables and make your decision making much faster? We cover a variety of um, asset classes, pretty much anything you need in the financial, political, business space. 250,000 topics right now, going to 200 million companies next year. A few of us had worked at Skype before we got acquired by Microsoft. So a team that understands building scalable technology. Our business model is twofold. One is we're launching a premium subscription along with partners like Bloomberg and Fitch, where and imagine no paywalls, everything loads in milliseconds, and no advertising or clutter. The second thing is we have a lot of structured data, and we've opened up the data to companies, banks like BNP Paribas, to fintech companies, to the IEX stock exchange in the US. Just take our API and build your products with that. <coughs> we are not just about idea and talking. We've quadrupled our revenue from last year. We are on the way to become cash flow positive next year. Um, and if everything works out, maybe even quadruple our revenue next year. Uh, fingers crossed. How big can it be? 
Just think about the content, be it music, be it uh, video. Also, there's a competitor, not a competitor, but focus on China, ByteDance, it is worth $75 billion. A massive, massive space. So this is how big we can be. And what we're doing is not just you know, text and insights, but it's also voice. So imagine in the future, you ask a simple question, what's going on with FinTech, and you get a summarized answer using natural language generation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm looking for the, this thing, yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. My name's Andrew Long, and my company is called Switchcraft. What we offer is a service that will simplify your life. Every one of us in this room pays bills. Electricity, gas, car insurance, home insurance, phone, broadband, the list goes on. If you want to get the best deal, you have to shop around. Then there's the issue of the loyalty penalty, where if you stay with the same provider, you will end up paying 30 or 40% more. What we do at Switchcraft is that we take the pain, the hassle, the stress out of the whole process. Our solution is a free service that automatically switches you whenever there's a better deal. Right now, our service is live for energy bills, and we have tens of thousands of customers, and we're going to offer the same service across all your bills. So, you save money, you save time, and you never have to worry about being ripped off again. And you are being ripped off. 60% of us don't shop around regularly. Each of us is paying around 300 pounds too much, which adds up to five billion pounds across the country. That's five billion that's coming out of our pockets and going into the pockets of the energy companies. So, how does it work in practice? You sign up on our website, which takes around three minutes. Our technology analyzes the deal that you're on and switches you at exactly the right time. When your deal comes to an end, we'll send you an email. You only have to respond if you don't want us to save you money but the decision is always yours. You can always cancel. I told you earlier, the service is free, so how do we make money? We get paid commission by the suppliers every time we send them a customer. It's that simple. Our progress so far has been incredible, and I'd like to share a few highlights with you. Since the start of 2018, we've been growing by an average of 25% per month. We've been featured in The Times, in The Financial Times, The Daily Mail, The Sun, on BBC News, on LBC, and on Talk Radio. Reviews from our customers are the best in the industry, with an average rating of 4.6 out of 5. Our switching process is completely automated, unlike our competition, which is doing it by hand. So, what's next? The loyalty penalty exists across all household bills. As I said, we're bringing the auto-switching approach to many new areas, including home insurance, car insurance, phones, bank accounts, and credit cards. We're also very excited about the impact of open banking. We're having several conversations with banks about partnerships where we can combine their data with ours in order to take the friction out of switching. If there's anyone here that works for a bank that would like to discuss a partnership, please come and have a chat to me afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Darius, and I'm a co-founder of Risk. So Risk is flexible insurance that adapts to fit your life. It helps you know what's covered, understand why it costs what it does, and figure out what you can do to reduce your risk. Insurance, ladies and gentlemen, the ability to share the loss of one amongst many. It's actually an amazing and purposeful idea. But where we take issue is with how the experience feels as it's delivered to today's customers. Trust in the industry is low, and the technology that underpins it often feels dated. <laughs> and importantly, for an entire generation of customers, they already have very different expectations of the digital services they choose to use to run their lives. We think the industry can do better. We think it's time for things to change. And today, I'd like to share some of the things that we think make risk special. To start with, our risk score helps lift the lid on the industry. It shows you what makes you more or less risky in the eyes of your insurer. And this commitment to transparency really helps to build both trust and confidence amongst our consumers. And 
we take the opportunity to share personalized, gamified bits of feedback as folks answer questions. And this provides the insight that allows them to make better decisions. And it also serves to ensure that our rating models always stay open to public scrutiny and lets them not become the opaque weapons of math destruction we so often see within our industry. From the outset, our platform has been built to support the concept of what we call macro insurance, where instead of siloed and isolated products, things come together into a single overarching plan that centers around the customer. So for me, instead of contents insurance and motor insurance and gadget insurance, I just have Darius insurance to cover the things I care about. No double keying and the convenience of everything in one place. And there are a whole host of other things that help elevate the risk experience. Self-service instant changes without the gotchas. A move away from annual policies towards something that's more akin to an ongoing Netflix subscription. And of course, claims that are frictionless, fast, and fair. Essentially, ladies and gentlemen, we've had the courage to go back to the drawing board and reimagine things from the outside in, from a customer perspective. And as a consequence, big insurers are starting to take notice, and they like it. Our partners are keen to support us and help us grow, and our customers love it. Thank you. Embrace risk. Hi, Andrew, I have a question. Um, you have an interesting model. I'm sure the platform is great, particularly the back end, and can scale up, but you have to get to scale. Sure. You're in a crowded market in terms of you know, the money supermarket, and so on, and now I have a different proposition. Sure. So how do you see go-to-market brand investment, awareness, and trust in your brand to, to choose you? Uh, sure, I mean, the, uh, I, when I say the product is the best in the industry, uh, you know, it, it really is. I can give you several data points. You know, for example, the conversion rate of our website is incredible, and uh, and it's been copied by 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 big competitors. In terms of getting the word out, uh, we did a deal last uh, October with News UK. So that's Rupert Murdoch's uh, newspaper publishing business in the UK, uh, which is you know a, a basically a partnership where where uh, where they use their, their media to get us customers, and that has been incredible. So we've got a partnership across the Times and the Sun. Uh, and wireless group radio stations, um, which has really you know, accelerated us. They looked at the space, they were like, which one of these emerging players do we want to partner with? And they chose us because the product was the best. So, so there's that, but you know, we're, not, we're not resting on our laurels. I mean, I think that's part of the answer, but really it's like, we just, we just work harder. We, we, we know we're deploying the same channels, but we work harder, we're, we're, we're competent, we're diligent, we're hardworking. And you know our, our competitive metrics, like our cost per acquisition, for example, is is much much better than than some of our uh, our competitors with deeper pockets. So you know, on the one hand, there's the deal with News UK, which has been great, uh, and on the other hand, it's there's I mean, there's no real answer really. It's just demonstrate that it works, demonstrate that you can unit economics work, raise money, spend it. You know, there's 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 no you know there's no magic answer. So sorry sorry the answer's a bit rambling, but you know it's not. It's not the kind of thing that you can you can pin down in just you know a few words. But I did my best anyway. Yeah. One more. So um, this one's for Darius. Um, the f besides your great user inter interface and the transparency, like what? Uh, obviously, cost is extraordinarily important. In insurance and how will you get to that? Because it it. Um, for example, if you apply through some of the sexier new ones like Lemonade or whatever, not, their costs aren't necessarily better. And I think that will obviously be a stumbling block for users. So how do you address that? So there's a couple of things that we do. Um, one, we tackle uh, cost of acquisition of customers in a very different way. So our model is B2B to C primarily. Um, so if you imagine someone going to a comparison site publicly, they're paying sort of like 50, 60 quid, we can get CAC down to, to about 15 pounds by leveraging partner relationships. There are lots of other things that we're doing as, as well. So we 
unbundle our product. So you only choose the aspects of cover you need. We're much more granular than a traditional I insurer. And that helps people really make decisions about what they want to protect and what they don't. Again, uh, bringing prices competitively. We've also done a lot of uh, sort of like data science and pricing work with our actuaries to ensure that our prices are competitive within the, within the market. So we've kind of looked at about 10 million quotes and made sure that we're, we're, we're coming in uh, at an attractive point. But we, we do think that, of course, price is a differentiator, but quality of experience is important when people are, are time poor. Darius also, uh, based on customer experience, can you speak briefly about your, uh, your complaint process and how do you ensure quality of that process because it's critical for loyalty with insurance? So complaints as well as customer care. So we, we have, we take great pride in uh, the, the whole area of customer care. So, so um, it felt strange being in a category which was kind of robo advice because actually one of our brand values as an organization is to be, feel personal. Um, so what we often do is we try and have a turnaround time with, with, with any kind of uh, inquiry. Uh, we, we take an approach which is assisted human so we can enhance people who, who, who have genuine queries uh, and, and assist them. Where something becomes a genuine complaint or, a, or a, you know, goes from what I call a grumble to a complaint, that's where we, we kick in because we are fully regulated by the FCA. You know, so we, we have someone who kind of looks at those complaint procedures, uh, audits the entire process, and, and ensure customers are treated fairly and, and recover. Thank you very much. Big round of applause. Category eight, personal finance and robo advice. I'm going to open voting now for this final category personal finance and robo-advice. I am also an assisted human, Darius. There you go. <laughs> so I'm going to announce the category winners. For each of the categories, you're gonna come up on this state, on this entrance, pick up your award from Dan, and then you're gonna come stand right here, and our friendly photographer, Alex, is gonna take your, Alec. Alec is going to take your picture, and then you're going to come and stand over here. After we've gotten all the pictures, all the awards, then we will start with our intelligent questioning from our panel of judges. <laughs> uh, okay, ready to go? Ready to go. Okay, so here we go for the category number one, Banking Enterprise Solutions. Can we please welcome up Nova Stone? For, whoo, that was zippy. <laughs> for category number two, please, oh, and that's distributed ledger technology and cryptocurrencies. Please, can we welcome Ethical. For, if you want to come and sit, you can stand right here. For category number three, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Congratulations to Outside Insight. <laughs> for category number four, FinTech for Good. Congratulations to Is My Bill Fair? Category number five, payments and FX. Congratulations to McClear. And for category number six, peer-to-peer -peer lending, alternative funding, and SME lending. Congratulations to Cressy. Category number seven, RegTech. Please, can we welcome Tracti? Good idea to send your client. And finally, category number eight, 
personal finance and robo advice. Congratulations to Risk. Thank you very much. Right, one round of applause for all of these category winners. I'm now going to hand over to our judges for the incredible grilling. Huh. <laughs> On you go, Mike. OK. Uh, so we talked amongst ourselves, and we decided there are two questions that we would like to give to each of you. Same questions. All right. So I'll give you one. And we'd just like to go down and have you answer, and then we'll give you the other one and go down and answer again. OK? So the first question is, please qualify us for us how you think about your traction. Me. I was just starting at the front. Just, oh, okay. How do you think about it? OK. Um, so at the moment for uh, risk, we're now growing at over 1,000 customers uh, per month. Um, we've required, required over. Uh, 5,000 customers to date, generating over two and a half million of gross written premium. In uh, Q1, we generated 1.4 uh, million of gross written premium, suggesting an annualized run rate of, of six million pounds. So we're, we're growing, uh, we're excited, and, and we're hoping to take that 1,000 to several thousand uh, by the end of the year. Great, thank you. So Tracti, there's 15 customers, but they're large customers who've got a number of um, people within the business. It's all a licensed property. Mm -hmm. The growth is going to be based on actually increasing the team. So Luigi's out there pitching for funding. Um, and working with uh, consultancy like, like Deloitte, bringing that to the different corporates and procurement partners. And that's international because the part the customers come from Italy, Switzerland, the UK, et cetera. Thank you. For Cressy, we're a very early stage company. We began in August 2018 with a pen and a pad. About three months ago, we began doing our lending. We raised close to a million dollars, and we've done um, lending in the last three months across 10 projects for approximately $200,000. We're looking for capital commitments between one and two million by the end of the year, and we have uh, projections that across the next five years, we want to have at least minimum $15 million portfolio in loans to our companies. Great, thank you. Um, for McClear, in the last 14 months, we've grown from seven employees to 29. We've sold over 350,000 smart rings worldwide. Uh, we have five banking partners and one consumer program live in the UK. So growth to us would be an additional four consumer uh, countries launched this year. Um, and an additional um, number of banking partners. Great, thanks. So for Is My Bill Fair, uh, we launched in November last year. Um, we had to submit the slides for this competition three weeks ago, and I put down 250,000 people have saved five million. It's now over 300,000 have saved over six million. Um, and we signed our media partner in the last few weeks uh, we should be finalizing uh, signing a charity partner on Friday because the customers who pay the biggest loyalty penalty are vulnerable customers. So we think we can do even more good there. Thank you. With Outside Insight, we're really reliant on partners to do pilots with us because we need companies that are willing to give us their data and then give us loads of feedback so we can make sure the algorithm is uh, really working as well as possible. So we were pretty excited by the results from our first pilot with this private equity firm. But there's so much more potential for what we could do with it. Um, and so I think uh, if I were to qualify our traction so far, I think it's um, really uh, the results so far are, are good. But there are so many more industries that we can approach and different um, sectors of finance that we can speak to. So I'm um, really excited once we've, we're really confident in the AI and we've really nailed the algorithms to see where it can go. OK, so Ethical's traction has all been about building communities at this point in our growth. So uh, we're really excited because we've got uh, partnerships with charities like Step Change and the Money Advice Service, which are going to be really instrumental to our, our go-to-market. 
uh, we're leading uh, some uh, a task force with the Westminster Frontier Technologies Forum, uh, the Government Blockchain Association, and, and so on. So, so those those partnerships are going very well. Uh, we've also we're also partnering with financial services companies who have agreed that they're going to put their products on our platform. Uh, and a banking platform as well as, as the rails for what we're doing. So, so we're, we're getting ready to go. Thanks. Uh, last year, we were independently measured as the 40, 41st fastest growing UK private company. Uh, we finished last year with five million pounds in contracts as of May 1st, uh, which uh, we're gonna have about 25 million pounds of contracts. I've just come back from New York where we've got our first salesman on the ground there to help us in North America. Uh, traction for us looks like leveraging our software engagements with companies like Avalok, where we have a number of clients using Avalok together with Novastone. And this year is the year when WhatsApp will be releasing its uh, business accounts more generally than just selected institutions. And with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people using, businesses using WhatsApp business accounts, it's going to drive adoption by uh, banks and other service industries as well as clients. The expectation will be that you can do service as a conversation through these accounts. And we want to be there to help uh, institutions that want to do this in a recorded, safe way. Great. Thank you. You guys all got done with that? And you like our second question still? Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to double check. Um, so um, for each of you, What's the next strategic risk you have to take off the table? Sure. Okay, so uh, for us, uh, we're just in the process of closing our Series A, so you know, ask me four weeks from now, that won't be a risk hopefully anymore. Uh, I think the, it's about scaling at this time. I've been here before, this is the third tech company I've started from scratch to exit the previous two. So it's, it's about not being, I guess one of our risks is being distracted by too many industries. What we've done is really exceptional. And when we go to other sectors in government, healthcare, policing even, uh, they say, why aren't you working here? And I say, well, we don't have the resource. Uh, but we are going to have to, we are going to work with some of those other agencies, uh, I think particularly intelligence and, and defense. But uh, that would be our next risk, would be execution and making sure we don't get distracted into too many directions. Great. Okay, so for us it's finance. Uh, we've been self-funded so far and we've reached a point where that's, that's no longer the best way. And if, unless we can increase the pace of what we're doing, then me coming and talking at events like this is just going to mean that somebody else picks up the idea and, and beats us to it. So I suppose that's our key strategic risk at the moment. Thank you. I think for us it's about choosing the right partner to sort of do the next pilot with because obviously we get a lot of interest from uh, investment banks, from um, PE firms who are keen to test out the technology, but we need to make sure it's a company that's really able to give us proper feedback um, and make sure that the AI that we develop is as strong as it can possibly be. And it's very tempting to jump at the first sort of offer, but I think we're trying to be very strategic and make sure that uh, the next company that we do a pilot with is really the right sort of uh, partner for us so that we can make sure that the, the product and the direction that we go in is as strong as possible. Thank you. Uh, so I think for us, it's finance as well. Um, we, need, uh, uh, we need to manage money carefully whilst we grow. Uh, the way we're mitigating that is, uh, is to grow volume via partnerships. Um, but also, we're really starting to see that network effect of people who've saved money telling their friends and family. So each month this year, volumes have grown, but the cost per arrival at the site has gone down consecutively. Uh, for us, it's resources. So our ring is a smart ring, and it can only be smart if it does multiple things. And having the resources within our R&D area to be able to build out those resources and build out those services um, is a risk for us. So resources for us is key. In Latin America, and particularly in Colombia, we see banks and other lending platforms loaning to SMEs between 16% and about 28% on an annual basis. And they report default rates between two and four. And we just can't understand what that, why with such low default rates, the, the interest rates are so high. So for us, it's getting the credit risk mix 
really right. Because if those, if those stats are correct, we could really lend at much lower rates than banks, counting the default rates, and have a really good product for fixed income institutional uh, investors and the like. Like everybody else, fundraising is always a challenge, but we think if we get the credit risk, the credit risk mix right, we will be able to solve that challenge for us. Great. For Tracti, it's getting the right people. The scale up and finding the, the people that can be part of a scale up resource that are the right people. Yeah. And that's, that's the cool thing for us. Thank you. I think um, they, they say that startups don't starve, they drown. And, and certainly we, we find that, that focus is, is sometimes a challenge, especially when you're working with, as a company of 35 people, with, with sort of huge global brands. And, and I think for, for me it's about making the right compromises and ensuring when you're, a, when you're a speedboat trying to pull an oil tanker that can be hard. And we need to make sure that, that we maintain the right balance without compromising on our culture. And you can exit stage right. Is that stage right? Exit stage right. And I will now allow our judges to leave the room. You'll be ushered into a small, quiet, totally secure place. Hopefully there will be cake. If there is, please bring some back. Oh, yes. And while the judges go and deliberate for a few moments, I'm going to invite a couple of people, very special people, to come up on stage with me. Um, and this is to discuss a pretty interesting question. So Susan Sternglass Noble, come, come and have a seat. Susan is a leading investor in global financial services companies. She's had senior roles at Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, CQS, and AXA Framlington. She was an early board member of the Swedish online stockbroker Avanza, and she continues to be an active angel investor. I'm also delighted to be joined by Priyanka Lila Romani. Yes, got it. Uh, currently the founder and CEO at Plinth, which is an operating platform for alternative investment managers. She was also an executive director at Goldman Sachs and has deep expertise in financial services, has been an advisor and a non-executive director to scale-ups and high growth technology enabled companies. So I have some statistics which you guys can help me check here. So today, the question that we're going to look at is how can female founders attract more investment? So out of the people who we had on stage, actually a sixth were women, so that's 15%. A quarter of the winners of the categories, however, were women. And interestingly enough, 50% of the judges were women. So I don't know if those statistics mean anything. Uh, two years ago, though, I would, I would say that the, the winner, the overall winner from Guard Square was a female founder. So Susan, let's kick off with you. You've got an experience as a banker, a fintech founder, and now as an investor. You left Goldman Sachs to set up an internet uh, bank, and life surprised you. Uh, and then a few years later, you left JP Morgan to go to Avanza in Sweden. Can you compare those two moments in your life and draw any conclusions? Do the Swedes do it better than we do here? <laughs> um, well, thanks, thanks very much. Um, glad to be here. Um, yes, life does have some surprises in it. Um, so I think that when we look at the question of whether or not there are uh, female founders and their success, their success in fundraising, we just have to look at the real world. And in the real world, things are complicated and unexpected things mm -hmm. happen. Uh, so when I left Goldman Sachs, uh, I left in 1995 to set up an internet bank. Uh, I could see that banks were not delivering good service. I knew about the internet. My brother was a tech entrepreneur in the States. Um, and I tried to set up, or I started to set up the bank. I had access to uh, people, probably to funding, to technology. Um, and then I found out I was pregnant. Um, and I was pregnant with twins. Hmm. And at that moment in life, it was really impossible to get any other sane person to quit their job to set up an internet bank. <laughs> um, and in, so, in fact, I made the choice uh, that I wanted to, that it wasn't practical, it wasn't realistic for me to try to be the CEO of a startup bank 
and have twins at the same moment, I might be a bit of a superwoman, not that much of a superwoman. <laughs> so that was realistic. Mm -hmm. I made that choice and I'm happy with that choice. Uh, so I, I rolled forward, went to JP Morgan, had a few years, the internet was taking off, we had the dot-com boom, and then I saw the, the, the beginning of online stockbroking. And uh, so I met a bunch of the startup companies uh, across Europe, and I chose to join a Swedish startup, uh, which was a fantastic company. Avanza is now listed in Sweden, worth more than a billion euros. Um, and I think that the difference between the two experiences are really two, business and cultural. So first, in terms of business, in the first instance, it was not a realistic business opportunity. It was a great idea. Um, but at that time, uh, I, had an, I had an email account, but most people didn't even have email accounts. Mm -hmm. Modems were dial-up, they were slow. There were no mobile phones yet. So, you know, in terms of the real world, you have to look at the real business situation. And then secondly, there are cultural issues. And what was amazing to me in Sweden, uh, so the CEO of, of Avanza at that time, uh, who was a, a fellow, uh, he had a young, young baby, and actually his wife had a second baby, but she was the CFO of another internet startup. Mm. And they shared the responsibilities perfectly between them. There was great childcare support you know, that they had confidence in, but there was also a culture of flexible working and of sharing those responsibilities. They both worked super hard and efficiently, but everybody trusted them to deliver, um, to deliver that type of high quality um, product, but in a flexible way. And I think that if, if we draw lessons, it really is, well, first of all, clearly you need government support for high quality mm -hmm. child care that is available. And there's been progress in this country, but we have a lot more to do. But secondly, there's just a change of culture. Uh, what, mm -hmm. I, what I think is interesting, though, is that on the cultural side, I think that that flexibility um, that technology companies can have benefits both male and female founders because you know men and women in the startup world all want to have flexible choices they might make different parenting choices at different times and I think that you know what you can see is that that really it's it's all parties benefit from that flexibility. Mm -hmm. Priyanka tell us about your journey as well what what have been the biggest challenges for you and do investors say anything that makes you cross? Do you think that they're saying it to you that they wouldn't say it to a male founder? I think that's an interesting question. So in, in terms of my, my journey, just you know, very quickly, I did come from financial services, so having been, been at a big bank in a corporate setting and then moved on to first having various roles before becoming a founder myself. And I have to tell you, the world looks very different from the founder's seat, no matter yeah. what they tell you otherwise. Um, but in, in context of what we're discussing, there, there is definitely a very different default position that I find not just investors, but at large industry placing women at. So what, what do I mean by that, right? In, in my sort of about a year of experience as being a founder now, um, there has been a significant number of conversations, enough for me to take note where when I start discussing my business or the potential for an investor to invest, I very quickly find um, investors first wanting to establish very informally um, where I am with, with sort of my, my family and if there is any risk to me going away mm -hmm. on maternity, for example. Of course, they ask very politely. Um, and, you know, also wanting to establish that I'm doing this to, uh, to have a 10x, 20x return, and this is, this is not a lifestyle choice I've mm. made. And, and that's kind of what I mean by default position. So, you know, it's almost like I have done or I have had to invest some initial work to, to kind of come up to the starting line. So we're mm. not even talking about sort of, you know, what the KPIs of my business are and what the value proposition is, what my go-to-market strategy will be. It's like I have to, I have to clear the gates as an individual mm. within the context of my individual circumstances before I qualify for then what might be the selection criteria for the business itself and me as the leader of the business. So it's an extra, an extra hurdle before you even yeah. start the race. Yeah. Yeah. So Susan, you're constantly looking at founders, I expect, and I expect you're looking for great leaders, people with strong drive, team players who can build a great team around them. And I, I imagine you're open to women 
men, all forms of different diversity. There's a lot of discussion now about unconscious bias, and I wonder how you check yourself on unconscious bias. How do you stop yourself from, from that? Well, it's a good question, and I think it's extremely difficult. I mean, unconscious bias by its nature is unconscious, so if mm. we were conscious of it, we wouldn't have it. And I think that um, it exists throughout, it's not just in fintech or in technology, it's in all walks of life that, that we have this. And I think we have to distinguish between uh, opinions garnered from experience, in, learning from experience, which is a good thing and a natural thing, mm -hmm. and bias, which I suppose is some kind of a decision not based on facts, but just based on some sort of Im improper assumption. And I, I think that we all have to work at it all the time. I don't, I don't think it's, you know, I think that we all have that. Um, it might be cultural, not just gender, could be racial, could be, mm -hmm. could be many, many issues. Um, I think that really what I try to focus on, I've looked at, I don't know, thousands of businesses over the years, is that you start by looking at the business, right? And often it's better if you get the pitch in writing first, you look at it, you look at the sector, look at the facts. Um, some of the, the, the pitches today were about ways to look at businesses based on the facts rather mm -hmm. than just on, on opinions, but starting with, with that first. Um, and then after that, when you meet the people, um, looking at them with as much as you can with objective and fresh eyes. And the way, the way I would characterize it is uh, whether you're meeting the, the founder of a, of a tech company um, or whether you're meeting the CEO of a, a FTSE 100 company um, or whether you're meeting a prime minister. You know, all people are imperfect. They're flawed. They have strengths and they have weaknesses and they have quirks. And so as an investor, what you're looking for is you're looking to understand what the strengths and the weaknesses of that particular person are, how you can counter or support them in those other weaknesses, and whether they're self-aware. Mm -hmm. And I think the main characteristic is that they're self-aware. And in fact, in the technology space, we <laughs> often love to invest in quirky, people. Um, you know, quirky can be incredibly imaginative and inventive, but we have to have a person who is self-aware enough to accept that they need to learn and they need to take advice. So, so I think that we can use that um, on a gender basis, but, but in, in looking for leaders generally of companies. You, go ahead. I think, I think I might just add something to it. I think one of the things we were speaking about earlier as well is even when investors are looking for characteristics of leadership, it is, it is quite important to just, just be aware that you know, what has very often been mistakenly considered a trait of leadership, i.e. You know, certain sort of machoism or aggressiveness, borderlining on aggressiveness, is, is not necessarily um, you know, a very sure indicator of drive or of ambition. Mm. And just because, you know, a, a female leader may tend to present themselves differently or you know may may, may not be uh, sort of as loud and about about sort of you know what they can do or what they will achieve the fact still remains and this is sort of the positive affirmations from a lot of research that's been going on that um, women consistently have been delivering better results not just within the entrepreneurship industry in fact um, asset management which is where my startup is focused female asset managers have consistently for 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 a number of years mm -hmm. have had better returns on on portfolios um, but just you know do not have that innate nature of sort mm -hmm. of you know uh, fist fist pumping or chest pumping or uh, <laughs> so just yeah just you know subtle subtle uh, things like that make a make a huge difference. So Susan, I wonder, have you done any analysis on the companies you have invested or the the number of female founders versus male founders that you've invested in? Um, no, so well, so primarily my career mm -hmm. was investing in listed companies, okay. um, and I've turned back to angel investing mm -hmm. since I've retired as a fund manager, and now I'm doing an ED and advisory role. So there's not enough statistically yet right. to have it. Um, <laughs> so, but I think that you know what we what I think that the main issue we see in terms of the numbers is one of the issues when when we do see. Uh, pitches coming in from all sorts of sources in in different technology space is it's the the biggest issue is that we're not getting enough pitches from women so in other words it's not mm. that we see lots of pitches and we choose the men mm. 
that most of the pitches are coming in for men. And what I wonder is, is because I, meet, I know so many highly qualified women, let's say in fintech, in financial <coughs> services, and many of the women who are, are, are very good in fintech are working in the large corporates. So they may be running the corporate VC arm. So they seem to have a sense of security still in the corporate and not yet willing to take that extra bit of risk to step out and be a founder themselves. So all I can say is, you know, if you know you do have the expertise, the intelligence, the connections, the insight, mm -hmm. and you know, if you do have a good business idea, then be, you know, uh, you know, we encourage people to to when they're ready to take that risk, mm -hmm. uh, because I think that when we see the pitches from high quality people, they do get listened to. We just don't see enough women potential founders. And once you get into that room, Priyanka, what's your advice for the female founder in order to stand out? So I, you know, equally applicable to me at this stage of the business that I'm at, um, try to approach the problem set as sort of rationally and as in a data-driven manner as, as, as I can. And in speaking to some of the fellow female founders as, as part of sort of community networks and groups um, that either I moderate or I'm part of, um, that's, that's the single sort of, you know, biggest advice or, or suggestion um, I would make. And I think it's particularly relevant because if you, if you look at the makeup of female-led or female-founded businesses, um, very often, a number of those businesses tend to be addressing problems that are directly, as a consumer group, applicable to mm -hmm. other women. So, sort of, you know, whether it's sort of baby mother products coming into the market, or sort of female health-related products coming into the market, and I think for the for the time period um, where you do find that the investor groups, whether they're angels or VCs or otherwise are still mostly male composed as a, as a group. Um, I think it is, it is particularly important to get across the fact that you've undertaken a business, which is a hard journey as a, as a founder to undertake, um, out of passion, but equally out of the size of the market and the economic mm. opportunity. And, and I just recognize that, that at the end of the day, investment as an, as an activity is a economic activity. And if you're able to make that case, then, uh, you know, it's just maximizing the probability of you getting invested as a founder. Right. Well, let's give a huge round of applause to our fantastic guests here, Thank Susan you. and Priyanka. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. I think the time has come. So we'll whisk the chairs away. And I will invite Dan to come back up on stage with me in order to present the final prize. All ready? Yes. Okay. All right. Judges, is that your final answer? Did you want to say something? Yes. yes. We just, uh, oh, here we go. Before we, before we present the... Uh, yeah, we there were tears upstairs. There were tantrums. Uh, the air turned blue with abuse. Mike cried. I cried. Uh, but no, we, we mean it very sincerely. It was an incredibly difficult decision. We've been very, very impressed with the quality of the pitches. It's not easy being up there. It's even more difficult to do it within a three-minute envelope. So before we present the winner, we wanted to thank all of you very much for your time and congratulate all of the companies for being here today. Thank you. All righty. So without further ado, I will announce the winner to come up on stage. And the winner is Douglas Orr from Novastone. Congratulations to you and congratulations to all of our category winners and to those who presented today. It isn't easy and you did a fantastic job. We thought that uh, Douglas and Novastone had achieved amazing traction for the stage that you're at. We thought the clarity and the level of focus was very, very good. The team were very strong, and you <laughs> clearly had a, a very good understanding of the market environment in which you were operating in. So congratulations to you and to Novastone, but also thank you very much to everybody else as well. Thank you.
Thank you very much to Intel. Thank you very much to all of you for having me here. My name is Edie Lush, and it's been a delight for me to be with you here at Pitch360. Let's give a final round of applause to our judges for sitting there and giving us a great result. <laughs>